Okay, so welcome to our lesson today for surgery. And today we are going to look at uh, a surgical question or a condition which we are going to revise from. So we can read the question. So the question reads as follows. The question is as follows. So the question is saying, uh, Mrs. Maria, so the question is saying, Mrs. Maria Chavala, aged 54 years, a widow with five children, has been diagnosed of breast cancer and she is scheduled for radical mastectomy. So the question reads again, Mrs. Maria Chavala, aged 54 years, a widow with five children, has been diagnosed of breast cancer uh, and she is scheduled for radical mastectomy. Question A says outline five stages of breast cancer. So question A is telling us to outline five stages of breast cancer. So when it comes to breast cancer, the five stages, uh, they start basically at stage zero. So when it comes to the five stages in breast cancer, they start at G stage zero so when it comes to stage zero this is a non-invasive stage of cancer and not palpable so you will find to say at this point the cancer is not even palpable and uh, it is non-invasive meaning it has not yet invaded uh, surrounding tissue then uh, the next stage is stage one so there are five stages we have been taught to mention or to outline five stages so they start at stage zero to stage four. On stage one, at this stage, the growth is localized. So when it reaches stage, stage one, the growth is now localized and uh, it is localized to the breast and the mobile and it is less than two centimeters. So as you are doing breast examination at this point, you realize that you'll be able to feel a nodule inside the breast and this is what we are calling localized because they're able to feel the edges of this tumor or cancer and it is mobile meaning as you are palpating it may be moving around the breast and it is less than two centimeters in diameter or wide so it is very small but it is palpable then at stage two the lump becomes fixed to the breast and is more than two to five centimeters. So at stage two, at this point, the growth or the lump is now or becomes fixed to the breast and is more than uh, two to five centimeters. So it is above two centimeters or above five centimeters, meaning at this point now, uh, the, uh, the tumor or the cancer has grown in the breast. Then during in, on stage three, the cancer cells spread to the surrounding tissue and axillary lymph nodes. So in stage three, at this point, the cancer now has spread to the surrounding tissue. So the cancer at this point, it has even spread to the surrounding tissue and also the axillary lymph nodes. That's why as you are doing breast examination, you need to palpate uh, the axillary lymph nodes, if they are swollen or they are, uh, they, they are inflamed, meaning there could be a problem with the breast and you need to check that woman for breast cancer. That's why at stage three now, uh, this cancer has now spread to the surrounding tissue, meaning it may even affect other tissue apart from the breast. Then on stage four, which is the last stage, here the cancer cells spread to other distant organs such as the liver, lungs, through the blood and the lymph nodes. So in stage four, this is the end stage of cancer, meaning at this point, this patient is now uh, just remaining with few few months or not a huge life ahead of them because at this stage the cancer now spreads to other parts even distant organs such as the liver uh, the lungs so they may spread also to the lungs uh, through and this may be through blood or lymph nodes so at this point the cancer may, may have metastasized to other body regions or body organs and spread and 
cause problems from there. So if you're able to see from my diagram there, uh, th those are the stages of cancer that I've been talking about. So these are the stages of cancer that I've talked about. So when you look at uh, stage one, stage one we have, we said it is less than, uh, it is two centimeters or less and that's the description. So it is very small at that point. On stage one, we said you cannot get anything, but at stage, you know, on stage zero, rather, you cannot get anything because at this point it is non-invasive invasive and not even palpable. But at stage one, now it becomes palpable. That's why we say it is even two centimeters or less. And at stage two, we are saying it is about around two to five centimeters, but at this point it is localized and mobile, but according to the growth, it's about two to two to five centimeters. Then on stage three, it is more than five centimeters. So on stage three, it is more than five centimeters and it may have spread to other regions like the axillary lymph nodes and also the surrounding tissue, meaning at this point the tumor is now grown. Then at stage four, so at stage four, uh, here we have said it, it has even spread, the breast cancer has even spread to other distant organs such as the liver and the lungs. So any size tumor growing into the chest wall and also spreading to other organs, meaning this is end stage of stage for breast cancer. So that those are the stages that we have talked about in the first question. So we can go back to the other question and read and answer the next question, which we are given in the scenario. So in this, uh, the question B says, state any five types of breast cancer. So question B st says, state any five types of breast cancer. So question B says state any five types of breast cancer. So as you are reading about, um, before we answer that question, when you start reading about uh, breast cancer, make sure you also understand about the drawing of uh, the breast or the diagram of the breast. And as usual, I've always mentioned that you need to draw. If it is during an exam, you need to draw uh, the breast which is visible to the examiner or the person who will be marking you or during your licensure exam, you need to draw uh, a, a, a diagram which is visible. As usual, you need to put a heading. My diagram here has the heading, meaning you also need to have a heading because it carries the marks. So when you look here, this is the and uh, this is a cross section of the breast. So the normal section or the anterior view you will see here, these are the uh, lymph nodes. And uh, that's the reason why you palpate in the axilla. So these are axillary lymph nodes. That's the reason why you palpate around this region during breast examination to see if they are uh, swollen or anything. Then you have the nipple and the areola. But when you get the cross section, this is the diagram that you need to draw and show the examiner, this one. So this is the cross section. So you need to show the ribs here. They need to be shown properly and you need to show also the muscles that there are muscles here, okay? Apart from that, you need to show the fatty tissue inside. So you need to show the fatty tissue, the lobes, the ducts, the areola, the nipple and the lobules. So you need to show all these things in your diagram and let them be visible to them examiner. Okay, we can now continue to the to the question that we are talking about, which is uh, uh, state any five types of breast cancer. So when it comes to stating any uh, any five types of breast cancer, we are going to start with the uh, lumpectomy. So we'll start with lumpectomy. So we'll start with the lumpectomy. So when it comes to lumpectomy, this type of surgery is, is used to, to patients with small, well-defined lesions. 
So hysterectomy, we are stating it and we are saying this type of surgery is used to patients with small well-defined lesions and the lesion is removed through a small incision made near the nipple. So lumpectomy, which is sometimes called segmental mastectomy, this one you are going to it's going to be used to patients with the small well defined lesions and the lesions are removed through a small incision made near the nipple so basically that's what happens in the first type which is a lumpectomy or segmental uh, mastectomy the other thing is that the surgeon here at this point removes the tumor surround, uh, the surrounding tissue and possibly nearby tissue. Typically, the patient will, un, will undergo uh, radiotherapy after lumpectomy. So to avoid the recurrence of breast cancer, the surgeon is also going to remove uh, surrounding tissue so that uh, all the dead tissue or abnormal cells surrounding the breast should be removed and reduce the chances of reoccurrence. But the patient may need to undergo radiotherapy after this procedure or this type of, um, of, of removal of breast cancer. Okay. Then the other type is uh, partial mastectomy. So any five types of breast cancer removal. So the question wasn't too complete. So when it comes to another type of uh, the cancer that can be removed, how the cancer, the breast cancer can be removed is partial mastectomy. So partial mastectomy can also be performed here. The surgeon removes the tumor. So here the surgeon is going to remove uh, the tumor along with wedges of normal tissue, skin, fascia, and possibly axillary lymph nodes. Radiotherapy or chemotherapy usually follows after surgery to destroy and detect the disease in other breast areas. So in partial mastectomy, the, the, the tumor is going to be removed along with the, the wedge of normal tissue, meaning the edges where it ends are going to be removed together with the normal tissue where this tumor was located, the skin, the fascia, and also the axial lymph nodes will be removed in this particular surgery, which is partial mastectomy. Okay. Then the other type is simple mastectomy, which is also known as total mastectomy. So the other type is called simple mastectomy, which is also called D total mastectomy. So the other type is simple mastectomy, which is also called the uh, total mastectomy. So in this type, this is where the, the entire breast is removed. So the surgeon uses the procedure if the cancer appears confined to the breast tissue. So, and the, so if it's confined to the breast tissue and there are no lymph nodes involvement, and then the, the surgery may be followed by chemotherapy and or radiotherapy. So if the lymph nodes are not involved, meaning the cancer has not spread to other parts of the body. So before the, the spreading occurs, the surgeon, the surgeon is going to remove the entire uh, breast, which is called the total or simple mastectomy. The other type that we can talk about is the radical mastectomy. So in radical mastectomy, this is when the surgeon removes the entire breast, the surrounding tissue, axial lymph nodes, pectoris major and pectoris minor muscles. So everything surrounding the breast is going to be removed, just as I've mentioned in radical mastectomy. The entire breast here is removed apart from the entire breast, the surrounding tissue, axial lymph nodes, pectoris major and the pectoris minor muscles. All those are going to be removed. So the last one that we can talk about is the modified radical mastectomy. So in the modified radical mastectomy, the surgeon removes now the entire breast axillary lymph nodes and the lining that covers the chest muscles. If the lymph nodes uh, contains cancer cells, radiotherapy and chemotherapy follows after the surgery. So this is what happens in modified radical mastectomy.
Okay, so we can move on and look at the other question. So the other question is saying, okay, so the other question is saying, describe the preoperative care you will give to Mrs. Chavana. Describe the preoperative care you will give to Mrs. Chavana. So a patient who is suffering from breast cancer, how do you manage it in surgery? If you are a nurse who's supposed to attend to this patient, how are you going to nurse this patient who is indicated for, for surgery? If you are a doctor, how are you going to perform this surgery? So when it comes to pre-op care, this one is mainly concentrated with the nurses because they are the individuals who are going to prepare this patient for this particular surgery and how do you prepare such a patient is it an emergency surgery or is it an elective surgery so when it comes to when it comes to uh, cancer when it comes to cancers so when it comes to cancers cancers are mostly uh, elective meaning you are going to use elective management or interventions as you are managing this patient so when it comes to writing, if you are writing this as an essay during your final exams, you need to start with a small introduction and then describe to say, I will prepare Mrs. Chavara for elective surgery since her condition is not immediately life-threatening. So since the condition has no immediate life-threatening, you are going to prepare Mrs. Chavara for elective surgery. So if it is the marker, they will already be interested in reading the management because you have guided them. Then after that, you can go to the uh, aims. So you can talk about the aims. You can talk about it to ensure that Mrs. Chavara is physically well to withstand the surgical operation and the effects of anesthesia. The other aim that you can talk about is to promote physiological well-being of Mrs. Chavala. The other one is to decrease anxiety by preparing Mrs. Chavala psychologically and spiritually for surgery and also to prevent complications such as infections. So you need to have those aims as you are managing such a patient in your mind and even in your management. Any surgery, you need to reduce the anxiety of the patient because anxiety is not good for intraoperative and postoperative uh, outcomes of a surgery or of any type of a surgery. So you need to make sure that anxiety levels are reduced. Then from there, you're going to move on to the heading, which is patient admissions to environment, which we have been talking about now and then in your management. So you need to admit this patient. And where are you going to admit this patient from? So you're going to say, I'll admit uh, Mrs. Chavara in a surgical ward, preferably the side ward to protect her from infection since patients with cancer have compromised immunity. Cancer patients have compromised the immunity or low immunity, so you don't nest them with other patients in the ward, but you're going to nest them in the side ward to avoid them getting an infection from other uh, patients. And then apart from that, you can talk about this patient being admitted at least a few days or at least five days before surgery to acclimatize her or acclimatize her to the ward environment. So you want the patient to feel comfortable, know well the ward environment. That's why you admit an elective for surgical patient a few days before the actual surgery so that they feel comfortable and they understand the environment that they are in. Anxiety comes in because the patient does, uh, doesn't know the environment and, the, and none of the things I would expect from that particular surgeon or fear of the unknown. And also to perform investigations. You need to do investigation observations on this patient. That's why you need to admit them. Unlike emergency surgeries where you need, you don't have enough time with the patient. That's why it's a bit different on how you manage such patients. Unlike elective ones, you have enough time with them. Apart from that, you can talk about the environment, uh, about the environment being clean and dust free to prevent infection, a quiet environment to promote rest since patients with cancer are usually fatigued, 
I will also ensure that the environment is well ventilated to promote free circulation of air and with good lighting for, uh, for observations. So you can talk about all those things in the environment where you are nursing this patient from. Then you move on to psychological care. So psychological care is going to help you prepare this patient nicely because now uh, this patient has anxiety, you need to reduce that anxiety. And the way you can reduce the anxiety of such a patient is through giving psychological care. So this is the ideal that should be done in our hospitals. Um, but most certain things are skipped or certain things are never explained. But if we do these interventions correctly, the outcome becomes better. So when it comes to psychological care, Mrs. you are going to say Mrs. Java is likely to be anxious because of the diagnosis of cancer and she may have fear about pain and discomfort during and after surgery. Then the other things that you're going to say is I will explain to her and the family members about her condition and the need for surgery to increase awareness about the condition and the surgery and also to allay the patient's anxiety. So those points you can mention them. You can also explain about the benefits and the, and also risks of radical um, breast surgery. So in your psychological care, you don't just talk about the advantages or the benefits. Tell them both the, the good and the bad and let the patient have uh, proper understanding of everything to say. If things go bad, such uh, the outcome may be this, but if things go well, the outcome may be this. And because you have breast surgery, we have other options like this and that, but the best for now is surgery, which is radical mastectomy. Okay. Then apart from that, you can also arrange for spiritual care according to the patient's religious affiliation. And also you can explain all the medical and nursing procedures, including investigation to be done on her before the surgery to gain her operation. So I need to explain to say such procedures are going to be done on you and do not think otherwise, but these are just going to help us manage you better. So I need to explain to the patient nicely. So after performing psychological care, at this, at this point, the patient now understands uh, why they need to go for surgery. And uh, they, uh, at this point, you now give uh, the, the pre-operative teaching. They understand what they need to do now. Then you go to the next setting, which is pre-operative teaching excuse. So when it comes to pre-op teaching here, you're teaching the patient information about what is expected of her before and after surgery, such as food restrictions, a few hours before surgery and after surgery, the importance of deep breathing and coughing, exercises, also arm exercises, early ambulation and diet adjustment after surgery. You also say I will teach the, uh, the patient about managing postoperative pain through relaxation techniques. So those are the things you are explaining in preoperative teaching. You are not repeating the same points from psychological care, but those are the things you are talking about. Afterwards, now you can give the patient to sign the consent form. So at this point, you bring in the heading of consent form signing. The patient needs to sign the consent form, even in the ward, you give the patient to sign the consent form. So a consent form here, it is just a legal document, which is signed by the patient, his relative or his relative to signify that he or she is, has understood the process of the operation and is willing to be operated on. Meaning you as a nurse and the doctors you are, you cannot be persecuted because that patient allowed you to perform that procedure. But if you perform a procedure without a consent form, meaning that is an illegal procedure. So health has its standard and its own way of doing things. Apart from that, you are going to say, I will provide a written consent to her to sign so as to allow the surgeon and his team to operate on me or on the patient. So you give the patient a 
a written consent form. Then afterwards, you talk about observations. After consent form, you need to talk about observation. And here, you talk about temperature, pulse, respirations, and blood pressure. You need to do all those things and explain why you are doing those things. Like, uh, for example, raised temperature may suggest the presence of infection, which should be treated before surgery, you know, before elective surgery. A high pulse rate and raised blood pressure may suggest hypertension or other cardiac problems, which will need uh, to be further investigated. Uh, then when it comes to uh, respirations, meaning the patient is a problem in the, the way the patient is breathing and you also need to correct that and also investigate further. Apart from those, uh, talking about those points, you can talk about or you can do the following. Maybe you can weigh the patient and also measure the height to determine his body mass index so as to determine or come up with the, the patient's nutritional status. The weight will also be used to calculate drug dosages. Remember, drugs need to be given per kg body weight uh, so that uh, you give correct doses. Then uh, apart from those observations, you can observe the patient's physical well-being as well as her psychological state by observing the emotional uh, disposition of a patient. And these are mainly displayed by the mood of the patient and the activity level. You find to say the patient maybe has a, a withdrawn mood, meaning they are still not okay. The anxiety levels are high and they are withdrawn to other people. They are, they are less active, they are inactive, meaning there is problem with the psychological state of this particular patient, which you need to, to, to improve on as a medical personnel before you force this patient to go for surgery because it may impair the outcome of the surgery. Then afterwards, you need to do investigations on this patient. Do your investigations so that um, you, you come up or you, you, you have proper interventions whenever the need arises and you have a clear picture of what you're supposed to do as a medical personnel. So here, since the diagnosis is already made, we have already the diagnosis, which is breast cancer. The investigations that you are doing are not to evaluate the, the patient's health status so as to, to, to come up with a diagnosis. No, the diagnosis is already there, but here you are just doing investigation for corrective interventions that can be taken for physiological preparation. For example, you can do hemoglobin to estimate or to rule out anemia. Or if you are estimating hemoglobin levels, you can do that and you can get blood for hemoglobin HB levels. You can also get blood for grouping and cross match to identify the patient's blood type in case of need of blood transfusion. You can also do a random blood sugar to, do, to rule out diabetes mellitus because uh, diabetes patient or DM patients, they have poor wound healing, meaning if they go for surgery, they may have impaired wound healing afterwards. Okay. And then apart from that, you can also do, um, apart from that, you can also do um, chest x-ray to rule out chest infections such as pneumonia. You need this patient to be breathing properly after anesthesia and after surgery, but if the chest is compromised, meaning survival rates of the patient reduces because they will need those lungs after surgery. Full blood count can be done to rule out uh, blood disorders and infections. Apart from that, you can also do urinalysis to rule out kidney disorders. So after those investigations and other investigations that you can do on this patient, you now move on to the nutrition. Elective surgeries, you need to check the nutritional status of the patient and ensure that they have good nutritional status because it means the immune system is going to be improved and also the, the general uh, condition of the patient. And it also improves the outcome. 
So on nutrition status, you, you talk about assessing the patient's nutrition status to detect any nutritional deficiencies, and these need to be corrected before surgery for satisfactory surgical outcome. So you need to do all those interventions. Then apart from that, you can give the patient nutritious meals or a diet which is rich in uh, calories, proteins, vitamins, and also minerals to build up the patient's immune system and meet the nutritional demands. You can also um, encourage the patient to frequent intake of, of fluids to prevent dehydration. So on nutrition, as you're heading or as you're doing interventions on nutrition, those are the things you need to do to this patient. Then from there, you move on to immediate preoperative care. So at this point on immediate preoperative care, this is on the day of surgery, meaning 24 hours before the surgery takes place or within 24 hours of that surgical procedure when it's supposed to be performed. So that is immediate care, that is immediate care. So on immediate care, so this is going to be, this, is, this involves the following, which is gastric preparation. The first thing that you're going to start with is gastric preparation. You prepare the stomach. And how do you prepare the stomach? You're going to withhold, or you, you say, I will withhold all food and fluid intake at least six to eight hours before surgery or before Mrs. Chabra goes to theater. And this prevents, um, possibility of vomiting and also aspiration of vomitus. That's why you're putting the patient on new pay oral. So if it's in actual practice, this is the time when you're also supposed to give the magnesium tricilicate, which is 500 milligrams. You give it at this point because you want to reduce uh, oxygen, I mean acid secretions in the stomach so that you reduce chances of the patient developing uh, ulcers of the stomach. Then apart from that, you can say, uh, I will explain this to the patient to gain her, con her cooperation. I will also commence a glucose-based intravenous fluid to prevent dehydration and the hypoglycemia. So you can talk about all those points. Then you move on to bowel preparation. So on bowel preparation here, you are encouraging the patient to open bowels because this is not an emergent surgery. It is an elective, so you are going to encourage the patient to open it, bowels before going for surgery. And then uh, you can also administer uh, uh, an evacuation enema. So you can also administer evacuation enema in the, uh, and this can be done in the evening and also the morning before surgical operation. And he, this is done to cleanse the colon and uh, yeah, to keep to cleanse the colon from fecal matter. Okay, and this also is done to reduce uh, chances of uh, fecal incontinence because remember the patient is going to be under general anesthesia, going to be under general anesthesia, and then uh, the GI is going to be paralyzed. So the chances of uh, of fecal incontinence is high. That's why uh, you are cleansing the colon so that the patient goes with an empty colon so that you reduce fecal incontinence during surgery because the muscles are paralyzed from anesthesia. After bowel preparation, you can go to bladder preparation. Here you're going to encourage the patient to avoid or empty the bladder frequently so that they empty the bladder. Apart from that, you can also insert uh, a catheter. You can perform catheterization to the patient, which can be used for frequent or continuous drainage of uh, urine. And this is going to be used throughout surgery and also during post op uh, care for continuous drainage of uh, urine. Then you move on to skin preparation. So on skin preparation here, you're going to shave the skin in order to have the skin free from uh, possible um, uh, dead particles or microorganisms, uh, which may affect wound healing or contaminate the surgical incision site. 
So here you can assist the patient to shave the armpits and also from the clavicle region, the armpits, the abdomen to the mid thigh, all the way to the mid thigh. And apart from that, you can uh, advise the patient to bath frequently and also before surgery so as to remove microorganisms. Okay. Then after, so after skin preparation, you can move on to other headings. You can now move on also to other, other headings. Okay. So you can move on to, to pre-medication. Here you can give the medicine to the patient. You can give the medicine to the patient. So you can give the medicine to the patient. We talked of uh, magnesium tricyclicate. So MMT can be given to the patient and we say this is 500 milligrams. So this is 500 milligrams. So you can give MMT to the patient, which is 500 milligrams. And you are giving MMT so as to reduce uh, uh, gastric acid secretion in the body. Apart from that, you can also uh, administer atropine, which is 0 0.6 milligrams. So you can administer atropine, which is 0 0.6 milligrams, IM or IV to reduce our production of body secretions. Then you can also give promethazine 12.5 milligrams to control nausea and vomiting, which is induced by general anesthesia. Diazepam 15 milligrams uh, IM or IV can be given to relax the muscles and also calm the patient. Then Apart from, so those are the common drugs that you can give. Those are the, those are the drugs that you can give. So mainly you are going to give injectables or IM drugs at least 30 minutes to an hour before surgery. You, just, you don't just give them any other time injectables or IM or IV, flu, IV drugs. You give them at least 30 minutes to an hour before surgery. Then after pre-medication, you can go to patient identification. Here you are going to uh, give a patient an identity band, so on, and the identity band is going to contain the name of the patient, the age, the diagnosis. It is also going to have the type of operation, type of anesthesia that the patient is supposed to receive, and uh, all those information. And this is done to prevent surgical errors. Then you can talk about uh, uh, now patient uh, transfer. So at this point, you can, uh, uh, before pa patient transfer, you can talk about removal of jewelry and other items such as the necklace, the dentures, the earrings, nail polish, any artificial thing on the patient's body needs to be removed. So yeah, everything needs to be removed as these things may have uh, microorganisms and apart from that a diathermy machine may be may be used which is used to close up or expose the areas and this one uses electricity so if you have jewelry and other things on the patient's body it may cause an electric shock then uh, gowning you need to gown the patient put the patient in the uh, surgical gown or the theater gown to prevent the transfer of infections from the ward to theater. And this also allows easy access to the operation site and also keep the patient home and maintain the patient's privacy. And then you transfer the patient to theater. So as you transfer the patient to theater, you collect all patients' records and check um, Check, check listing to ensure that everything has been done. The vitals, immediate vitals have been done and all the patient's details are correct and everything. And once you reach the theater, uh, you explain or you give a comprehensive handover. You give a comprehensive handover. Then when you come back, you make a post-operative bed uh, in the 
uh, from the acute bed. So you make a post of uh, bed in the acute bed in readiness for the uh, for the patient after surgery. And here in the acute bed, you have all emergency equipment and drugs present in case of worsening condition of the patient. So you need to do all those things. Uh, so you are going to do this whether you know the patient won't survive or will survive the surgery. For you, you have to anticipate their return from surgery. You don't just say, no, the condition of the patient was the worst. I don't think they are going to make it. That is not your job to decide who lives and who dies. For you, you have to, to anticipate their return. That's why you make the post of bed. After post-operative bed, then you mention, say, I'll com communicate to the relatives. At this point, you now need to communicate to the patient's relatives to say the patient has now been taken to theater and the surgical procedure will start and it may last for this long and you'll be able to see the patient once the surgical procedure is done and you'll be informed. So basically, that's how you can manage preoperatively. That's how you can manage a cancer uh, we, uh, of Mrs. Chavala, which is breast cancer. So we'll talk about post-operative management later, but for now, we'll, we'll focus on preoperative management. So if you are writing in an exam as a medical personnel or as a nurse, this is how you are supposed to outline your points and this is how they are supposed to be outlined you cannot mumbo jumbo them you need to follow this same order because when you mumbo jumbo these points you are going to get a different set of management remember i said this is elective if you mumbo jumbo them they may make an emergency surgery and then you may not get correct marks the last question is saying, state any five points you will include in your IEC on discharge. So you need to state five points you will include in your IEC on discharge. You can talk about uh, exercise, exercising regularly, not the exercising that you have seen because of increase uh, of uh, coronaviruses, of coronavirus rather, no. This is exercise because you need the patient to improve in the body circulation, in blood circulation, and also prevent muscle wasting. That's why you're encouraging the patient to exercise uh, regularly after surgery or on discharge. You, you also in, you tell the patient not to perform strenuous exercises. Even though you're encouraging the patient to perform exercises, but you tell them not to perform strenuous exercises okay then apart from that talk about wound care here you say i will educate the patient on how to clean the wound by using a clean material and the prescribed uh, antiseptic solution to prevent um, to, to prevent infections and also promote hygiene so on the hygiene, you can have hygiene as your own heading on hygiene. You encourage the patient to, uh, to, to, to intensify or maintain personal hygiene by bathing daily to remove the dead epithelial tissue and preventing infection. Then you can also, on IEC, you can tell the patient about the breast prosthesis. So you can tell the patient about breast prosthesis now, uh, which um, so the uh, the processes are not fitted until the uh, the until maybe six after six weeks after the uh, the surgery was done and until when the incision has healed and is no longer tender or there is no pain on it that then they can have an artificial breast. Then uh, clotting, you can also advise the patient about clotting and tell them to say during the period before the incision is healed, the woman should be advised to wear uh, bre, bre, the, the, the things that they should wear, which are lightly padded with the soft fitting. So they should wear things which are lie, padded with soft fitting or a temporary soft prosthesis or a plain cotton cloth to cover the gums and also lightly tucked to, to the sides of the, of the breast so that 
uh, the, the clothing are not too tight, the clothing are not too tight on the breast, which may injure the breast or increase the chances of hemorrhage. So those are the points uh, that you can give on IEC. And when you're giving IEC, try as much as possible to give IEC relating to the patient's condition, not just general IEC and you forget about the patient's condition. So that is um, that is all about um, breast cancer. So that is all about breast cancer. So continue with our lessons uh, next time and uh, be sure to, to go through the notes and be able to ask questions and be able to ask questions. So we'll see you next time and continue studying and also reading and also continue preparing for the exams. Thank you. We'll see you next time.